Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey. I'm back in Grays Lake, Illinois, the Reformed Forum studio. Delighted to have with me some good friends to talk about an important subject. Uh, continuing on in our conversation of Van Til's defense of the faith, we have uh, Dr. Carlton Wynn, who serves as a minister, as a pastor down in Westminster PCA in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome back, Carlton. It's good to see you today. Thank you, Camden. It's wonderful to be here. Yes, we love your your new digs and uh, all the bu- brilliant uh, books that you have in the background. For those, it looks like you have two copies of Bovink. Oh, you know, you got one Machen and one Bovink, but they look similar from a distance. Yeah, I've got a couple of um, of Bovink books behind me. I discovered today that I somehow have two copies of Volume Two, which I'm very pleased about. I don't know how I stumbled on a second copy. One's marked up, and one is clean. And it's in my top five of, of the RD. all-time favorites. Yeah. Yeah. Who, <laughs> how in the world did we get along without the RD back in the early 2000s, late 90s? Anyway, we have with us also Dr. Lane Tipton, who's pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania, and a fellow here at Reform Forum in Biblical and Systematic Theology. Welcome back, Lane. It's good to see you, too. Camden, it is great to see both of you, brothers, and I am truly delighted to be here. As uh, as Listeners may know who've been with us for a little while, uh, we are embarking on a new Van Til group uh, for quite some time. I think we've done 66 episodes now with a couple excursies uh, where Lane and I have been uh, talking and and commenting on Voss's book, Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments. We do that really once a month, ends up being maybe about 10 per year. And uh, we thought, along with Carlton, we had this tremendous idea where we would walk through uh, Van Til's book, the, The Defense of the faith. Now we're working through first edition copies here, although there are three editions. Uh, the second edition is more abridged. The third edition includes annotations by Dr. Scott Oliphant at Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, so we're commenting on this and walking through it um, at a regular pace. We're going to, f- you know, find out where our stride is. So it's been quite some time, maybe about a month and a half, two months since we did episode one, but now we're in episode two, and uh, we're going to carry on with a discussion of the doctrine of God. You can find this even if you don't have the first edition. We're in part one, chapter one, section one, the doctrine of God, which is pages 23 through 29 in the first edition. But before we open up and talk about the doctrine of God and Van Til's discussion here, it's important that we do so in context and understand what Van Til is addressing and why he's talking about these basics in theology, in systematic theology, no less, in a work on apologetics. Carlton, I was wondering if you could uh, remind us where we are in the subject, why Van Til's talking about uh, polemics, and and why this at this point early on in the book. Yeah, thanks, Camden. I would love to do that. Uh, if the listeners remember, we did our first episode on the introductory material to this book, where Van Til says that the primary reason he wrote this book is to set forth in positive fashion, a biblical approach to apologetics. He says he's doing this not only for students of the Reformed tradition, but also for critics. Uh, I think implied in that is a a call to those in the Reformed tradition to really reflect on our own hearts, our own methods as we talk about theology, maybe uh, repenting of less biblical, um, inconsistent Uh, forms of reasoning in our theology and in our approach to apologetics. But secondly, Van Til says he's writing this to address contemporary objections uh, to his thought and to his apologetic method. Now, no sooner does he speak of these contemporary objections than he dives right into them. And uh, if the listener wants to go back to that earlier episode, we tried to give a taxonomy a sort of classification of these contemporary objections, largely coming from his own uh, Dutch colleagues, uh, many of which wrote articles against Van Til in the Calvin Forum Journal. But uh, I think, Lane, I think we settled on this uh, this description of these contemporary objections as, as being, on the one hand, um, advancing an infection thesis. Uh, namely that Van Til's theology has been so thoroughly infected by non-Christian thought and especially non-Christian philosophy, uh, principally idealism, that he has severely departed from the Reformed tradition. Uh, but, But in addition to this infection thesis, we have a rejection thesis. Uh, that is, Van Til's opponents argue that Van Til also 
takes the reform tradition in such a way that he finds no point of contact with any non-Christian thinker at all. And Van Til is making the obvious point that his critics are themselves contradictory in their allegations. Is he so infected with non-Christian philosophy that he's no longer Christian? Or is he so resolutely uh, committed to the uniqueness of the Christian faith that he has no point of contact when dialoguing with unbelievers? Now, Van Til is going to concede, uh, he's going to recognize that his opponents concede certain points about his own position, they too acknowledge the chasm of difference between Christian and non-Christian thought, they too recognize in Van Til that he acknowledges common grace insights in various non-Christian thinkers, as he puts it, truth as far as it goes. But after Van Til does all this with respect to his contemporary critics, he says, we're not going to understand the criticisms uh, well enough unless we first understand the structure of his thought. So uh, leaving those contemporary critics aside for the moment, Van Til launches in part one into the structure of his own thought. And one of the first things he says is, uh, we are interested in defending the Christian faith as a unit. We're intent on taking all of the deepest presuppositions revealed in the scriptures concerning God and creation and man and covenant, and image and Christ and the atonement, and we're seeking to advance the Christian faith as revealed in the Old and New Testaments of Holy Scripture. And he says the way that Christianity has been taught as a unit is under various logical headings in systematic theology. And so Van Til's approach is going to be to take up those logical headings, uh, beginning with the doctrine of God, to advance his own thoughts so that we might understand his distinctively reformed apologetic and be able to understand his answers to his contemporary critics. So there you go. In this, in this episode, I think we're probably just going to be able to talk about uh, Van Til's wonderful and foundational discussion of the doctrine of God, maybe teasing out certain features of his discussion that are relevant for apologetics. But, but understanding Van Til in his own terms as he reaffirms a classically reformed understanding of who yeah. God is. That's very different from other approaches, and uh, that's what Van Til is seeking to do, is to demonstrate a fundamentally consistent and faithful biblical apologetic. But for Van Til, a biblical apologetic is also a reformed apologetic, because the reformed theology and the reformed approach to defending the faith is the most faithful to Scripture. So these are not uh, differences, or in apologetics is not some sort of arbitrary choice, or the way we defend the faith is not just whatever method we decide to do. He's seeking to advance a very specific God, the God who has revealed himself in a very specific way. So Lane, as Van Til starts, he speaks about systematic theology, and specifically the doctrine of God being of fundamental importance. Why is that so significant before we even talk about how to defend the faith? Well, it's, uh, it's really, uh, I, I guess from the outset, showcasing the distinctive character of Van Til's method for him to say that, because for the doctrine of God to be of fundamental importance, Van Til is simply saying that before we speak of what we're defending, we have to know the God who has revealed himself. We have to know that he is and we have to know what he is. And so by fundamental, Van Til means that the doctrine of God is of most basic structural significance for us, if for no other reason than this, the most basic distinction that Van Til makes in his apologetic and the most basic relation that he programmatically sets forth is the creator-creature distinction and the creator-creature relation. And as we begin our apologetic, Van Til wants us to recognize that what we believe about God in the creator-creature distinction, what we maintain about his identity in the creator-creature relation, will have a governing influence on every other topic that we address. So you could think of it this way, that before we talk about man, 
before we talk about Jesus Christ and sin, before we talk about salvation and the church, the most basic issue that we have before us is the character of the God who has made himself known. And until we understand that, until we get a grasp on his nature, we're not going to be in a position to understand how we should defend or express an apologetic in light of that character. And so Van Til's taking us to what is, um, I think, characteristically within a, a biblical, Augustinian, and Reformed frame of reference, he's taking us to the foundations of apologetics, which really does begin with the doctrine of God. And so Van Til says, naturally, the doctrine of God is of fundamental importance to us. Lane, do you think that it is fair to say that when Van Til says the that must precede uh, the how, or that our defense must presuppose who God is, do you think it's fair to say that already implied in this discussion is a question of method? of how we know who God is, that is by way of his self-revelation, certainly through nature, but especially given the fall through scripture. It seems to me that Van Til places such a premium on knowing who God is at the outset of his discussion that we can't adequately address that question without self-consciously uh, articulating a revealed and reformed conception of God over against the wild panoply of idols that the human heart is prone to construct when not self-consciously submitting to uh, the scriptures of God. In other words, the kind of God we have in mind needs to be self-consciously distinguished from, say, Friedrich Schleiermacher's living God, who is uh, the, the whence, as he puts it, of our religious experience, or, or Karl Barth's um, uh, event notion of God beyond all human apprehension, or, or Wolfhard Pannenberg's uh, power of the future, or uh, uh, Gordon Kaufman, who taught at Harvard Divinity School, said the word God is just a human construct by which we order the world. All of these things, and we could go even um, maybe to be a little more controversial in, into the ancient period and say Aristotle's unmoved mover. Um, all of these things are, are non-Christian substitutes of who God is. So am I rushing ahead or is it fair to say the methodology question is already at least implied here? Well, Van Til is explicit later in this book that the starting point, the method, and the conclusion are interdependent and mutually contextualizing at every point. And here, relatively speaking, he's not yet discussing method and he's not yet discussing conclusion. This is starting point. And that starting point is the God not of rational reflection, not the God of community experience, but this is the God who in his self-contained sovereign triune identity reveals himself in the works of creation, in an act of voluntary condescension we call covenant, and makes himself known to the creature and is himself, as Van Til's going to say, our interpretive concept everywhere. He says that in Common Grace in the Gospel, but that's here. So, Carlton, I think you're very insightful to bring that up at this point, remembering that the starting point, the method, and the conclusion are always mutually contextualizing features in a Reformed theology and apologetic. But because we can't say everything at once, and because we can't yet get to method and conclusion, I think you're very wise to remind us here that when we have this starting point, we have such a starting point, the triune self-contained God, 
immutable and impassable in his relation to the creature because of our method. We are beginning mm -hmm. with God because we meet him in his self-revelation. And as Bavink and the Reformed tradition have made explicit, we have no knowledge of God at all apart from his self-revelation, his self-disclosure uh, to us as creatures. And so, yes, I, I think that's really important because it keeps us from grounding theology in some kind of rational function of man or some communal interpretation of experience that is, is in, in one way or another isolated from or not dependent on the outset on the revelation of God. So yes, I, I think that's a wonderful point to make. So on that front, what are the things that Van Til starts to address immediately? I mean, we could start under several different headings. Uh, we spoke about Bavink earlier. Bavink likes to start very early on with the names of God. That's how he reveals himself, and we learn things about the names of God. Van Til seems here, uh, at least starting on page 25, to start to address the attributes of God, which are, is also a very significant and important place to begin. And he does so using a traditional distinction between the incommunicable and the communicable attributes. But what do we see about Van Til and his approach to theology proper, even in the way he starts to, to speak? What I love about this section, Camden, is that um, Van Til is going to give us quick but profound snapshot looks at the attributes of God, beginning with the incommunicable attributes and then moving to the communicable attributes. Now, he's a, he's a faithful uh, follower and at times critic of Herman Bovink, and he's going to end up saying some things uh, that make it clear that the communicable and incommunicable need to be taken together. Mm -hmm. And um, and he's going to speak more explicitly later on as to method. How do we how do we arrive at these attributes uh, by way of revelation? But it seems to me that he's very clearly following the order that Bovink lays out in volume two of his Reform Dogmatics. I, I've got the index or, yeah. or the table of contents open. Independence, immutability, infinity, unity, and simplicity is the order of the incommunicable attributes. And this is basically the exact same order that Van Til uses in his discussions. Carlton, so, I think that's an important historical theological point that needs to be reiterated. So I, I just want to butt in and just say that. And along the lines of what Lane just lectured on down at Mid-America Reform Seminary, if people haven't seen that yet, the videos are available. Lane did a, a two-lecture series on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology, Reformed or Revisionist, in which he demonstrated a, a much of Van Til's sources. Van Til's leaning upon Bovink and others explicitly. And for us, if we don't know Dutch, Bovink was introduced to the world other than Our Reasonable Faith, which has now been you know, reworked and uh, published under its um, more faithful title, The Wonderful Works of God in English. Prior to 2003, we didn't have the dogmatics. Van Til did. He's Dutch. He reads Dutch. <laughs> he also had Voss's dogmatics, and he was also fluent in German. So Van Til has access to many things of which the Anglophones exclusive Anglophones didn't. And somewhat that has been lost upon many people in the United States, particularly critics of Van Til, who assume he is just making stuff up and, and inventing theology and apologetics on the fly. He is explicitly developing uh, what his colleagues have done, not just here in the United States. He, he mentions early on, he's, he's leaning upon John Murray and just telling you what John Murray said and saying, this is my view, but it's his job to do the systematics. I don't do that. As well as in the background, very clearly leaning upon Bovink and Voss. That's not an imposition of Bovink and Voss fans imposing it on Van Til after the fact. It's an historical point that helps us understand what Van Til was doing in the first place. Yeah, I think that's really good, Camden. I, I, maybe one of the reasons Van Til moves so quickly through these attributes is because he takes it as a given yeah. that these are understood by the reader. They've been articulated at length um, by Bovink, and so he's just going to walk through them very quickly. But what he does say, I find fascinating at key points. And so, um, you know, maybe we could just take a brief moment and look at some of these attributes. He, he starts with a saity. And he writes on page 25, 
Uh, by this is meant that God is in no sense correlative to or dependent upon anything beside his own being. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to uh, nickname Dr. Tipton Lane, no correlativity Tipton. And uh, I want to know in a snapshot look, Lane, why divine aseity is so critical uh, to Van Til. So no correlativity Tipton, take it away. Well, uh, I'm just following Cornelius, no correlativity Van Til. Uh, um, he, he, I think what we have to appreciate here is uh, when Van Til brings in that term, not correlative to, here's what he's affirming. He's affirming that God is self-contained, self-complete, and independent of all things. Here's the key not only in himself prior to and apart from creation, but in relation to creation. So it's, it's, it's critical to appreciate this. It's typical for theologians, maybe not steeped in Bavink or the Reformed tradition, to say that the aseity of God is simply talking about God in himself, wholly apart from his relation to creation. But what Van Til's wanting us to recognize, especially using that language of correlativity, is that the moment God relates to that which is not God in his sovereignly willed work of creation, God is, and this is italicized, God is and remains absolute, self-sufficient and self-contained independent of the creature, and that means he is not acted upon or determined by the creature at any point in his relation to the creature. And so this is, a, this is something that really is critical to understand. Apart from relation to creation and in that relation, God is self-contained, self-complete, absolute, and the idea of, of mutually dependent relation to creation where God and the creation are equally submerged in a process of historical development. That's what Van Til right up front wants to deny. And in its place, he confesses this thoroughgoing doctrine of God's independence. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, one of the things I love that he's going to bring out a little bit later is that this notion of divine absoluteness is a definite biblical conception of absoluteness. And if you go back to Bavink in that second volume, I know we're talking about Van Til here, but Bavink is at pains to say that this notion of absoluteness is not the abstract uh, absoluteness of of philosophical thought that would seek to um, abstract certain features from creation in order to arrive at a master concept, which, which on that approach would end up being an empty absolute. Uh, this absolute, when we speak of the being of God, is an infinitely full and rich and wonderful uh, living absoluteness of being. And this is the presupposition for all of God's activity in space and time as he reveals himself as the absolute immutable God at every point. And so the, the listener needs to get accustomed to having a definite conception of divine absoluteness, a definite conception of tripersonality, a definite conception of the creator-creature distinction and relation as we move ahead. But I'm going to hold off on a particular point that I want to make until we get there. Well, you uh, know, just quickly, uh, before we move on too far, this is a, a sidebar thought, but it's building on what both of you brothers said. One reason Van Til might move through this so quickly in his dependence on Bavink is that a number of these men who criticized him were themselves Dutch theologians. And so they would be very familiar with Bavink. And yeah, I think good. Van Til moving so quickly, following seriatim the topics that Bavink treats in his RD2, is saying to them in almost encoded language, brothers, I am following Bavink. 
I'm being orthodox as far as I understand it, as it's represented by Bavink. And the starting point here is if you're going to follow Bavink, you cannot affirm correlativity at any point. The relationship of immutability to the aseity of God is worth uh, pointing out. Um, he says, naturally, God does not and cannot change, just stop. Um, well, he goes on to make it explicit, since there's nothing besides his own eternal being on which he depends. Now, the point that Van Til's making here is one that's just basic, and, and Carlton's already said it really well, that this infinite fullness of God's personal being, which is living and active and self-contained, self-complete and fully actual, it is that being that comes into view when we think of God, not only in terms of the eternal processions, internal to the being of God, but especially when we think about the missions of God in relation to creation. And I'll just point out two things from the text that Van Til uses. Malachi 3.6, and there's a little typo in the original. It's James 1.7, but we would all know that it's James 1.17. Those are kind of two of the great texts that anchor this. And I'll just put it briefly, and, and then we can elaborate on it. Malachi 3.6 says this, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. What's the point? The point is that a covenantal God is not one who has taken accidental, mutable, contingent properties to himself, submerged himself into the historical process and become conditioned by creation and by time and change. Rather, the covenant God is the absolute God. The covenant God is identical exhaustively to the self-sufficient, self-contained absolute God. And James 1.17 makes that so explicit. In giving every good and perfect gift, God does not change like shifting shadows. So rather than his actions involving some change internal to him or some actualizing of a passive potentiality he has within him, what, what we have here are the actions of a self-contained God from beginning to end. And so there's no room in Van Til's thought here for a covenantal God who in his covenantal dealings with man somehow becomes mutable or changes in that relationship. To put it negatively, what do you think about this? We're, I love how he puts it, God does not change, cannot change, since there is nothing besides his own eternal being on which he depends. It seems to me Van Til would have to say negatively, were God to depend upon something besides his own being in light of Malachi 3.6 and James 1.17, the very promises of God in his covenant faithfulness would be threatened. Yes. And the gospel fabric <laughs> would begin to disintegrate. And if we bring Voss into the equation and the Pauline eschatology, when he talks about the very character of eternal life, is a kind of, I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, a kind of replication of the fullness of life that is intrinsic to who God is. Then we begin to see that the very character of our unbreakable bond of fellowship with God is itself a reflection of the immutable living being of God himself. We don't enter into that being. We don't become participants in that being. We don't become divine ourselves. But in our covenant fellowship with God, in the confirmed fellowship that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ, what we're getting is a revealed analogy, an ectype in fellowship with God of the glory of his own immutable being. Brothers, when we sacrifice this, we sacrifice the integrity of the gospel and the very fabric of eternal life in Jesus Christ. And I love how Van Til is is, is implying this in his affirmation of this attribute of God in say. Yes, and, and just to, to, to say one thing in addition to, to, to supplement that point, and um, tell me if this is a good way to put it, and if not, let's fine tune it more. 
But for Van Til, this is not simply a point of theological orthodoxy. It is that, to be sure. But I think for Van Til, this is what preserves the integrity and assurance of true religion, that we can trust in God and have um, a, a religious foundation and certainty for that uh, religious uh, foundation, which is an immutable God, a God that doesn't change. And, um, and so there's, there's really nothing of greater practical religious value than a robust confession of God's immutability. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, what about, uh, why don't we just touch on infinity a little bit? What, what is significant about the infinity of God? How does it flow from his aseity and his immutability? Van Til says his infinity uh, it needs to be understood with respect to time and with respect to space. So, so now we're getting into um, at least um, by way of derivation, the creator creature relation. Uh, God in himself is eternal and immense. And this has implications for the creator creature relation in as much as God uh, does not experience a succession of moments in history along with us as temporal creatures, nor is God included in or confined by space as the absolute immutable infinite God. And yet, God sees all things in one clear, certain, and unerring view, and he is not absent from any point of space as the infinite, immense God. So we're, we're getting the mysterious character of the creator-creature relation uh, creeping in here as we think about the attribute of divine infinity. Lane, anything to add to that? Oh, that, that's beautiful. Just a couple of thoughts. One, by God's providence, we just had a Voss group on Jehovah's relation to time and space. Yeah, yeah, good. It, it really, really congeals here. But um, you could put it the, in, in, in two ways, one positive way, one negative way. God is above space, yet everywhere present in it. God is above time, yet everywhere present in it. But God is not changed in any sense by his relation to space or time. And I would just say this, that all forms of theological rationalism will posit at some point spatial and temporal qualities that God somehow takes on when he relates to creation. And as you just summarized, Carlton, Van Til will have none of that. It would be a rationalistic move to say that somehow the infinite and eternal God, when he relates to space and time, becomes like those things in space and time. It would be a fundamental confusion of the creator and the creature to speak or think that way. How then does the unity of God relate? I mean, there's so much of these themes are similar to that Voss group. And it makes you think that, you know, Van Til obviously was leaning upon Voss, but they're all reading and interacting with similar material. But when we're speaking of the infinity of God and also the aseity, the independence and the immutability, it would entail also that we have some sort of unity of God. Otherwise we're positing different aspects of God, some different than others. How does Van Til utilize the, the unity of God and how does that really come into play, especially as we move on towards discussing the Trinity eventually? Yeah, j just as we distinguish when we're speaking of the infinity of God, we distinguish between his infinity with respect to time and with respect to space. So too, when we talk about the, the unity of God, we have to make a distinction between, and Van Til does it here, uh, the unity of singularity, by which he means the numerical oneness of mm -hmm. God. There is one God, one being, one mind, one will, one eternity. So the singularity, uh, the unity of singularity, and then uh, the sing uh, the unity of simplicity. Yeah. And um, before I go any further on the, on the numerical oneness of God, let me just say publicly on record for all to hear that Lane's lecture 
recently at Mid America on the Trinitarian theology of Antioch, which you referenced, Camden, in my opinion, and I told Lane this earlier, was a master class in Trinitarian theology. And central to his exposition of Van Til's Trinitarian theology was that he was following old Princeton and old Amsterdam by way of the Hodges, especially A.A. A. Hodges' commentary on the Westminster Confession and Bavink with respect to the numerical oneness of God who is triune. And it was just, I just commend it to the listener to go mm -hmm. and listen to that lecture a couple of times. Um, but that being that. said, that being said, in Van Til's discussion of simplicity, let me just read something that will dovetail with everything we've said so far. This is on page 26. He says, the attributes of God, this is an entailment of simplicity. The attributes of God are not to be thought of otherwise than as aspects of the one simple original being. The whole is identical with the parts. And then he says this, on the other hand, the attributes of God are not characteristics that God has developed gradually. They are fundamental to his being. The parts together form the whole. So without diminishing one bit our confession of numerical oneness, we affirm a God who is his attributes, right? even as we distinguish among those attributes on the basis of his revelation. And we affirm that no matter how much God reveals himself differently and acts differently and speaks differently in time and space, we dare not conclude from that that God's attributes somehow develop gradually through space and time. Because as Van Til says, they are fundamental to his being. And what we're getting is a disclosure of his attributes, a revelation of who he is at different times in different ways through redemptive history. I think it's worth mentioning up front because Van Til here is not at all contradicting uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which very clearly says God is not composed or he's not a body made of body parts or passions. When he says, when Van Til says the whole is identical with the parts, he's not speaking of a complex God exactly. or a composite God. Parts is used very loosely there. Perhaps if we were speaking more precisely, that word shouldn't have been used at all. Nevertheless, we speak of the attributes of God, but whenever we're speaking of an attribute of God, we're not speaking of the fact that God is built of blocks or Legos or something that, that we has love and joy and peace and justice and infinity and aseity. And then all of these form together like some cosmic Voltron and into, into the triune God. No, God is God. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons subsisting in one essence. And there are attributes we can, we can, that, he, that he is but he is the attributes, not composed of the attributes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's that's very helpful, Camden. And 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 I think what Van Til's wanting us to recognize, a different way to put this, is that there are no accidental properties that God adds to himself when he relates to creation, mm -hmm. or either by way of his eternal decree where he decrees to relate to creation, or by the work of creation itself, or in his special act of providence by which he voluntarily condescends to offer himself to Adam as, his, as Adam's blessedness and reward for covenantal obedience, in, in no instance does God in his relation to creation take on or will himself to have new accidental properties that would make him composite. Yeah, maybe not originally, simplicity. but he would become composite in history. And Van Til yes. said, absolutely not. He's, he's neither composite or complex before, during, or after. He yes. is who he is, always and at every point. And the, you know, but, but contrary to the Reformed view here, you can, you can think of Socinians, Hegelians, process theists, open theists, 
all of them affirm this tenet in some way. There, there are going to be cosmetic differences, to be sure. But fundamentally, all want to say, uh, Schleiermacher and Bart, you can add to this group, that when God relates to creation, in that relation, God himself changes by way of either permutation, alteration, or addition. He takes something new to himself, wills something he did not have before, um, takes on or gains attributes as accidents that are added to who he is essentially. And there are a number of, of examples of that from uh, ancient into the modern era where God's simplicity is affirmed as long as God is not thought of as related to creation. But once he relates to creation, that simplicity is altered, that, that simplicity might be maintained, but then there are new properties that qualify and characterize God in his relation to creation. Properties like ignorance, mutability, passability, emotional and intellectual development. And once that happens, it's a baseline departure from this classical doctrine of simplicity, this reformed and biblical conception of simplicity that Van Til's advocating following Boving. Lane, I appreciate your ever-present insight into uh, this topic and Camden very adequate and fitting words to add. Um, I'm sure we're all, we're all in agreement uh, in what you articulated and the importance of articulating it. One thing I wanna add that may be helpful for listeners is that the idea that new attributes would need to develop gradually for God to interact with his creation rests on the idea that God in and of himself is unable to relate to creation. And so again, as we proceed in this discussion of Van Til, he's going to say later, and I don't know if we want to go there now, um, on page 27, that we, that we can't attach a non-Christian conception of divine imminence to a non-Christian conception of divine transcendence and actually get a biblical conception of the God-world relation. And to posit that new attributes need to develop gradually or that God takes on new attributes in order to relate to creation presupposes, I would argue, a non-biblical conception of divine transcendence in as much as it holds that God in and of himself prior to and apart from the world is somehow inhibited by his divine aseity. That aseity is, is like a, um, it's like a cage that keeps God from relating to the world. It's a, if we were to take an unbiblical notion we mentioned earlier, an abstract notion of divine absoluteness and say it's a deistic conception, uh, and what does a deistic conception need? It needs the addition of some kind of mechanism that would achieve eminence or relation. Well, already you've started with a deistic conception of divine transcendence that's going to require some kind of maneuver to get God in touch with creation. The answer is not a mix and match kind of theologizing but it is a recognition of the biblical conception of God in himself, who out of the fullness of his being makes a completely free uh, transition, as, as Voss puts it, uh, from his own eternal necessary existence to creating the temporal existence of the created world in relation to him. This is something that God needs nothing beyond himself in order to do and accomplish. Um, Speaking of this notion of unbiblical transcendence and unbiblical notion of imminence, I have a little illustration that I want to run by you guys, okay? <laughs> you remember the, uh, the, the little game called Jenga? Sure. Yeah. Where yeah. You, 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 know, you make the little tower of the little wooden blocks and you take turns tap, tap, tapping out a little Jenga block and the last person to tap one out makes it fall. Okay, we can't do theology like a Jenga tower. Some people want to take a non-Christian philosophical system, okay? And they want to recognize what's non-Christian about it, but they hear things in it that sound good, like 
God is one or God is immutable or something of that nature. And the so what, they, what do they do? They take, they take their finger and they start tapping at a little piece of that theology very carefully, very deliberately. And they tap, 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 tap. And they want to slide out that wooden block. And then they get a Christian block and they want to slide in the Christian block and tap, tap, tap it into place. What you get is an unholy mixture of Christian and non-Christian blocks, and they cannot stand together. The tower is going to fall. What we need to do is take the non-Christian Jenga tower, and we need to, in love, with patience, pulverize it into dust. Second Corinthians 10, 5, destroying re- strongholds. <laughs> and replace it with a thoroughly Christian tower that is not even a Jenga tower. It's an organically complex, pluriform, and related body of revealed truths serving the covenant relation that God has established with creatures so that we might know him as his redeemed people. So I don't know if a reform forum mug is in the order, (laughs) but no Jenga tower (laughs) theologizing. Uh, Carlton, I love that. Um, it, you know, and when when we're thinking about this relation of God to the creation, the idea that God needs some additional contingent, mutable relational properties in order to relate to creation, shared by all forms of correlativism that we just talked about earlier, that's really laid to rest when you remember the theology of the new relation. Now, I'm going to just borrow from Voss here from his Reformed Dogmatics 177 and 8, Volume 1. And and we've said it before, so I'll be brief in summary here. But in the sovereignly willed new relation of creation, the creature changes, the relation changes, but the God who relates does not change in the relation. And that's the specific point of mystery that, In the new relation, God himself does not change as the relation changes and as the creature changes. And the temptation for all of these forms, whether it's that evangelical form we talked about a second ago, or whether it's a Hegelian or modernist conception, whatever form we're talking about, um, it's that in the new relation, there is reciprocal newness for God and the creature together. It's a reciprocal newness where both are changing because God has taken to himself, willed for himself to have um, the properties and qualities that qualify creaturely change in time and space. And it's just that, 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 that Jenga block is what we don't need. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I love that. I'm for that mug, by the way. I think that'd be a beautiful mug. Oh, I don't want the mug. I want to make the game. We're going to have to have a table game. <laughs> Brothers, yeah, I, like I it, think Carlton. one of the things that's going to become clear as we work through this book is, just to add this point on it, we have to remember the point about common grace. And uh, the, the form of the block may look similar <laughs> to the formal features of a non-Christian Jenga right. tower. So materially we have to pulverize the non-christian tower okay but please don't hear me say that there aren't formal features of certain forms of non-christian thought that resonate outwardly notice all of the qualifiers i'm giving uh with a christian worldview sure and so there are common grace features but what i'm saying is in removing that block, we can't just deploy it in a Christian system without significant adjustment within the organism of biblical revelation. That's very the main helpful. point we want well, to say. Well, to mix very metaphors, helpful. Van Til will be very clear about his illustration of borrowed capital, or we might even say stolen capital, because what what is quote-unquote Christian or the common grace features that belong to a non-Christian structure have been stolen to begin with. That's, that's yeah. the point. And, yeah. and it's not to... We don't want to extend this metaphor. It's not to say that the Christian view is a blockhouse view that you could take parts of it out. That's that's not that's mixing the metaphors in a, an, inappropriately. But whatever features we find that would be helpful or you know useful in the non-Christian system, 
are not the non-Christians to begin with. They stole them from the Christian uh, worldview and the Christian system and um, from the Christian's pile of Jenga blocks. Uh, uh, so <laughs> no Jengoistic theology yeah. allowed. <laughs> now, we're, yeah. Okay. okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Very but helpful. I, I think we better say something, and I know this discussion relates to his section on communicable attributes, but Van Til doesn't give as much description of communicable attributes. He lists spirituality, invisibility, and he, and he spends some time with omniscience. So, and, and one point I thought was useful in, in pointing out um, his commentary on omniscience is that he says that God's knowledge of the facts of creation comes before the facts themselves exist. Whereas for us as creatures, we must investigate the facts that already exist in order to know them. For God, knowledge of the facts come first. And if you remember uh, back in the uh, objections, his critics, contemporary critics, one of his critics said, um, said, if it, and I'm quoting here, if it is possible to say that God's thought is constitutive of facts, is it not also necessary to say that the facts are constitutive of God's knowledge and therefore of God? And the point that this particular critic is making is that Van Til is leaning into a philosophy of idealism here, where the rational is the real, the real is the rational. And Van Til's going to try to rebut that here and later on page 234 in the book. But I think it's important to map out uh, how, let me just ask this question maybe to you, Lane. How is this point about God's thought being prior to the facts of creation not leading inexorably in an idealist direction for Van Til? Well, Van Til makes this point that on the top of page 27, God does not need to look beyond himself for additions to his knowledge. In all forms of idealism, and especially the, um, the, uh, the philosophy of absolute idealism, God as the absolute principle of unity, if you want to call it God, idealists aren't uniform in doing that, but that quote unquote absolute comes to no space time particularity in a symbiotic correlative mutual relation to it so that he comes to know facts in symbiotic interaction and reciprocal and mutual relation to those facts, but not before. And so the unfolding of the historical process is the unfolding of the knowledge of the absolute, if you're thinking about absolute idealism. But for Van Til, knowledge of facts comes before the facts for God. And this is the key. This is the death of the idealist premise. God does not need to look beyond himself for additions to his knowledge. All forms of the absolute do. And so that is a, 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 a fundamental antithesis to the way that the absolute comes to through history comes to know things as they occur yeah um this this really dovetails into one of the final sections in this um in this discussion on page 28 when he's talking about the personality of god and i know your mid-america lecture dealt directly with this material but yeah, yeah. insofar as god is absolute in his knowledge of himself and all things related to him. Insofar as he exhaustively decrees whatsoever comes to pass as the one in whom all intellectual and moral life is absolute and immutable. Uh, Van Til wants to affirm that God is absolute personality. And I find this to be such a helpful point of reflection and meditation as we think about uh, the covenant relation that we enjoy with God, that we are, that we are related um, as his image and in redemption to the God who is absolute in his personality, certainly as the triune God, as Van Til is going to affirm. But when we speak of divine absolute personality, what exactly are we affirming and why is it so important 
I'll just make reference to those lectures that I that I gave and give a, the briefest snapshot that I know yeah. that an entailment of the numerical unity of God's essence and an entailment of the divine simplicity is that God is a self-determined, self-complete, self-conscious personal being. And in Bavink's language, he is an absolute personality, and that absolute personality opens itself up in a threefold differentiation. I think, again, Van Til right here is making reference to Reform Dogmatics 303 of Bavink, just as he has done in the attributes that come before. And, and so what he's, what he's wanting us to recognize, contrary to someone like Gordon Clark, is that God is not an impersonal mute substance that somehow has three thought bundles included within it, but that God is a supremely, absolutely personal being. And the way I put it, wrote a dissertation years ago, I'm revising, trying to get to Camden before Christmas time for uh, publication, is this. And Lord willing, this could happen. Stranger things have happened. But um, the, the language I used in the title of the dissertation was the triune personal God. And the idea there is that you can't look anywhere in God with his essence or the personal subsistencies who are that undivided essence. You can't find an impersonal speck or crevice in God. There is nothing impersonal resident in his being or essence or nature or the persons who are that nature distinctly as they subsist entirely as it. Uh, so th that's the, the, the short version of what I tried to develop in some detail in those two lectures that we did at, at Mars. That's excellent, brother. I, uh, where we're going to go with this with Van Til is that to use your language, the fact that there is no impersonal crevice or speck in the being of God as the absolute personal triune God is going to have as an entailment given creation that there is no crevice or speck of this created world in which we are not face to face with this living personal God Absolutely. and therefore obligated to think his thoughts after him under the light of his word. And Amen. so right here, uh, oh, what's the language you used with me years ago? The cards are being drawn, brother. <laughs> the cards are being drawn right here yes, with, respect to our, with respect to our apologetic method, our epistemology and our theology of the Christian life. It begins here. And that's why the doctrine of God is of fundamental importance for the Christian who is a theologian as well as an apologist thinking God's thoughts after him with respect to any speck of God's created world. Mm -hmm. Amen. So Amen. that'll definitely lead us into Van Til's discussion of the doctrine of man. And of course, uh, throughout this entire book, uh, we'll, we will continue to explicate even his covenantal theology, which uh, helps us understand the God-man relation. Uh, this is a fundamental feature of Van Til's apologetic, and um, I'm couldn't be more excited to, to talk about it and to work on it over the months and years uh, with you two brothers. So thanks so much, Carlton and Lane, for joining us today. Uh, we do want to point people to the website. Head on over to reformedforum.org where you find information about all of our programs as well as our online courses. Van Til's, uh, an intro to Van Til's uh, apologetic is available already. Lane taught that. It's the first of eight planned courses in the Apologetic and Theology of Cornelius Van Til. We have recorded the second course, which is on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology. It's in the, the works of being edited. Hopefully we'll be out by the end of the year. And of course, uh, information and everything's available online. You can subscribe to our email newsletter if you'd like to get updated on new publications and things, including our newsletter. So take a look at all that. And I want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>